Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink, inspiring public curiosity about food. Learn more at mofad.org. I'm HRN's Communications Director, Kat Johnson, with a preview of this week's episode of Meat and Three, our weekly food news roundup. This week, we're celebrating Valentine's Day. Whether it's your favorite day of the season or you avoid it like the plague, there's no debating. It's a big day for the world of food and hospitality. Valentine's Day is what we uh, refer to in the industry as a blackout day. I don't feel that my manlyhood is threatened when I order a glass of rosé or, God forbid, a rosé champagne. It's an old Jamaican drink from way back, and we just decided to bring it back into existence. It's a drink that the men, they believe it really does wonders. Tune in to this week's Meet and 3 on Heritage Radio Network. That's M-E-A-T plus sign T-H-R-E-E. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. On today's episode, we head back to the Grand Cayman Islands for the Grand Cayman Cookout. We speak with Chef Amanda Cohen about the humble beginnings of Dirt Candy, her rise as a chef, and speaking out about the inequalities for women and being a voice that everyone else should adopt. We then head into our archives, back to one of our favorite early episodes of Snacky Tunes, where Computer Magic plays her space music for us and takes us to the stars. So sit back, relax, and here's another episode of Snacky Tunes. We talk about food, we talk about music, with musical dudes, finger on the pulse, snacky tunes.
Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm one half your host, Greg Bresnitz, coming to you to you from the Cayman Cookout. What are we doing here, Chef Amanda? Come on. What, how did we get? How did two New Yorkers get to escape? I don't know. <laughs> My friend just texted me. They're like. Um, Two things. Um, I hope your trip is great. And fucking my pipes just burst. <laughs> and I said, I'm so sorry. I'll try to keep the post in two minutes. <laughs> That's sort of how I feel. Like, I don't want to tell anybody I'm here. I know. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm working really hard, but clearly I'm not working very hard. I have no idea why we're here, but it's pretty nice. Is this your first time? It, it is um, to the point when they invited us, which is very nice. Uh, I had to call Darren and be like, <laughs> I think someone's fucking with us. I, I think so. And it's like, I don't, I don't know. You do something 11 years, I guess. Right. I guess they say they just it. finally get yes. around to you. <laughs> yes, which they, they started 11 years ago. I was like, I guess these paths you know, we'll eventually end up on the same road. Anyway, thank you for sitting down with us. Um, very quickly, for for the few people who don't know, Dirt Candy, what is it, where is it, and how does a girl from Toronto open up a vegetarian forward, but not vegetarian restaurant right. in New York City? <laughs> Uh, Dirt Candy is an all vegetable restaurant. We've been open for 10 years, uh, 10 years this October. And, uh, you know, my, my dream my entire life was to live in New York. So after I came to New York City for university and uh, I traveled around a bit afterwards, but really my goal was to get back to New York. And the only thing I really liked to do was cook. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if this is gonna be my career, but uh, <laughs> I think I need a skill because I need to pay rent. And uh, truthfully, actually, the, the idea was to get the skill so I could travel more. And I got the skill and I kept falling in love more and more with New York. And I, I mean, I traveled some personally, but not professionally. And for, a, for those who say New York is dead for artists, why is it not dead for artists or chefs? Well, I don't think it was. <laughs> I'm not sure now it's not. I think it's a really hard city now for artists. It's just so expensive. I don't know how kids do it. I mean, I moved to New York City in 1992. Yeah. And, uh, it's called Redwood. <laughs> it's called Redwood. <laughs> That's how they do it. <laughs> I know, and I'm such a snot. I'm always like, you know, I didn't move to New York to like not live in Manhattan. I know. And, I mean, I've only ever lived in, in Brooklyn, so I've, I've never done it. But I, I understand. I always think that like cultural centers are always shifting. I mean, there. I'm sure in the 70s when Lower East Side was thinking, like, I didn't move to New York to live below 14th Street. <laughs> so like, I, like, excuse me. So I think it's like one of those kind of like of the time of the moment. It is, you know, you get really attached. I went to NYU, my first, you know, the dorm was in the village, it was in Washington Square Park. And then my first apartment was actually on 9th Street, uh, just up the street from where I would eventually open uh, the small Dirt Candy. Would you walk by it like in the early days of Dirt Candy and be like, if I could tell younger Amanda that yeah. it would like, it'd be okay, I would tell her it's okay? Totally. I'd also be like, I should have kept that apartment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the rent was really good. What I thought was crazy expensive, now I'm sure like if I just kept it, it would be totally reasonable. I know we had a two bedroom for 1400 in <sighs> South Lawrenceburg and I was like, why did we get rid of this? We could have painted the walls. I know, <laughs> right? I had like, for a while I lived in Spanish Harlem, not the East Village, but uh, and I had a three bedroom and our starting rent was 1200 It was so good. And you know, there's people who are from, my aunt is in like a rent controlled building in the eighties. That's like $450. She's like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> Even back then. Um, one of the things that's I've noticed is a through line for your restaurant and your evolution is the, the idea of a creative constraint. First you had a very small restaurant right. and then you had a very big restaurant and then you went and went to a kind of prefix menu. Um, talk about how constraint um, and some would argue, and I would mention mm -hmm. that just cooking with vegetables is also a certain con constraint. How have you used that self-imposed restrictions to further your creativity and your evolution and, and the food that you serve? I mean, it's hard, and this is a really hard question because you're asking about creativity. <laughs> and so I don't know quite how it all works, and I have a, I can sort of go into more depth about it, but please, well, please it, it's hard to, uh, asking about creativity is one of those things, and people are always like, how do you do it? How do you make creative dishes and, you know, how do you look at a broccoli and end up with a broccoli hot dog? Um, and to me, really, the only way I know how to do it is if you start in a box. Because I have to be fighting against something mm. to get an idea mm -hmm. outside of the box. And everybody works really differently. And then you start with the idea and, you know, the idea changes and, and you forget about the idea. And then, like, two months later, you're like, yeah course I'm going to put broccoli in a bun and call it a broccoli hot dog and it seems so yeah. stupid <laughs> duh <laughs> um but so for me my creativity really does it has to start in the box 
I have to have the talent. And and when you open Dirk Canyon's new space, you talk about getting a pasta maker mm-hmm. and having all these options. And what was the what was one of the dishes that was uh, almost where you didn't have a box where you thought, okay, we like we're just going off the rails. This is like too labor intensive. This is too like such a waste, but it just made it on there because you had no constraint, no box. Well, I think that's one of the reasons we switched to the tasting menu because sort of you know restaurants have really changed in new york over the last couple of years and it's like been going fast and like you know we had started i swear i closed the little dirt candy and, and i will get to the dish but i closed little dirt candy and when i reopened i was like yeah i'm gonna have appetizers and entrees like a normal dish and it was only like a four month period we closed or five month period and in that time everything was small plates like i couldn't get people to order the entrees they're like no we'll just have all the appetizers or we're just going to share everything and not like i'll have this and they're going to have that and we'll switch halfway through it was everything was put it all in the middle and i was like okay well this isn't really going to work with my menu and the composed plates and so then we went to small plates and then i realized i can't i can't do the menu i want to do with small plates because it's too fussy (laughs) and like it's two bites and people are really angry that I'm asking them to pay, you know, $15 to conclude it uh, we'll for, get to that. <laughs> for two bites. Um, but really that's the labor, the idea and the labor going into it is really worth this much. And I then sort of had this breakdown. I was like, you know, I, I really want people to be here for the show and, and enjoy not just the food, but everything we're able to do. And so when we switched to tasting menu, that, even though it seems really, God, to me, I think people think of it more as a box because you can't do everything you want to do. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I just really want to do lots of little plates of vegetables. Um, but it gives me this formula of where I can put dishes on the menu. And we have this dish that's the Peking peas. And uh, it's our play on Peking duck. And I have a grill, tiny little uh, grill. And uh, we grill, or the, the actual people at the table, we don't do it. Uh, they grill. So, uh, each person gets two sugar snap peas and they grill the peas themselves. And we have tiny little uh, pancakes and plum sauce and tiny little cup vegetables to put it in. And this sort of like tofu or soy skin yuba that's deep fried and slacker to look like peeking duck skin. And it's ridiculous. And, you, and it's actually two bites and people taste it and are like, this is amazing. And I'm like, yeah. And I couldn't have done that on, right. on a regular menu because it's two bites and it's ridiculous right and you can just serve like a prep and hope you serve right. 10 of them that you have to know you're going to serve all of them you have to serve all of them and i wouldn't even know what to charge because the truth is it's a really expensive dish. there's we waste a lot of charcoal in that dish every night when it goes out and that's actually probably the most expensive part of the dish and then the labor is really expensive but the main part it's not like it's this like yeah. amazing like piece of like lobster or like this gorgeous like langoustine or caviar or whatever it's it's a pea. And no it's one's pea. and no one's gonna really understand and, and nor would you even expect them to understand it because some people are not going there to get a lesson in like economics right, of a restaurant. Exactly. They're just like, I wanna taste something delicious. Let's go back to the, the boxes for the self imposed boxes for uh, a minute. Um, not just for you but for advice for other chefs because everyone's gonna have a different scenario or right. things like that. How do you build these boxes? I think or what <laughs> advice would you give to people? Because obviously it's like, right. I, I understand that, but the, a better thing, how do you, what advice do you have to build these boxes? And, and even so, it's like, where to, where in your career should you impose the boxes? Because you just turned 10. Right. And the restraints now are not the restraints you had before. No, they're not. And I can actually go a lot more outside of the box or a lot more inside the box. And that's a lot of customer trust that I've built out. But you should never build a box <laughs> until you really have an idea of what kind of food you want to cook because the kind of food you want to cook is the box. So Mm. it's, I cook my, my true box is I cook vegetables. (laughs) That's what I do. Um, and I, so there's all these ingredients that I choose not to use. Um, and, and I could, and you know, I've always said this, like, you know, if I ever found a piece of meat that made a vegetable taste better, that actually made the vegetable taste better, I would totally use it. And, 10 years into this, I haven't found them. Now, there's things that are delicious that go with vegetables, like caviar. <laughs> as, <laughs> we, I, as we just had right. lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe fish sauce is great. There are all these extra umami things, but they're not really making the vegetable taste better. It's just a really delicious taste. Um, but that that's my box, and it's what I do well, and I, and I love to cook within that box. So I think one of the things that happens, and 
you know, if you watch a lot of Kitchen Nightmares, <laughs> you know, Gordon Ramsay's always like, what are you doing? This menu is insane. It's all over the place. And if those chefs ever actually were like, you know what, this is the tradition I grew up in, or this is what I know really well, that's my box. And I'm going to cook within that box, and that's going to let me get outside of that box. The other side of this equation, and everyone is creativity, and I'm imposing things, and I'm making these things, and pulling it from the ether, and that's the really sexy side, is the actual cost and the bottom line of running a restaurant, which I believe is another box. (laughs) And and you touch on this, and you've spoken before about just essentially almost the logistics of imposing a a cost structure box because it's more cost effective. It's like, where does the creativity kind of end and then the responsible business <laughs> owner begin because I think that that's something that chefs like don't realize or young chefs don't realize right. that you have to actually have both you can't just be this no. wild flame out because you'll cook for a year and then your investors will be gone and be out but it's sustaining something like you've done for 10 plus years right well the truth is the the um, financial box is more important so and then that's really hard to understand um, that you have to be a better business person than you are a chef or you have to have better like a really good sort of like financial advisors around you if it's not you yourself because it's so hard to run a restaurant particularly in new york city i mean i think actually there's a bunch of cities where it's really hard um but uh when you (laughs) that box that financial box and if you're comfortable and if you know what you're doing within that lets you be more creative but if you are falling apart at the seams, you don't feel safe enough to be creative. Right. And, you know, you need people who are also telling you and who are really good at advising you who are saying, you know what, that Peking pea dish is ridiculous. Get it off the menu. It costs too much money and it's not, it's not worth it for you to spend all this labor and all this time to do it. And you're, it's actually all your food costs are in it. And you said you moved to New York all those years ago. You've had the restaurant. When did you learn that insight that you have to be better financially than a better cook? Because that is not a young person's insight. No. You know, I I had this opportunity about maybe 15 years ago to start. uh, Well, actually, I was running a restaurant. This is the first time I learned anything. And uh, What restaurant? (laughs) It's an old restaurant uh, called Heirloom. It was only around for like maybe a year. Good chef, bad finances? Uh... Good chef, because I was there. Okay. <laughs> Actually, the finances would have been okay, and the executive chef was um, lousy. Okay. Uh, so the lessons that were learned. <laughs> yeah, the lessons that were learning was at some point he actually turned to the general manager and was like, the investors want us to have a budget. And both the general manager and I, who were sort of new at our jobs, were like, huh, do you need to have a budget? And he was like, yeah, now you're going to write one. And we're like, but you already opened. And he's like, right, but now you're going to write one. And we were both like, okay. And so we sat down to write it. And we both looked at these numbers and we were like, wow, this restaurant just really isn't going to work. And we learned like Excel and like how to do it. And we spent like sort of like six weeks putting together this budget, like from all this stuff on the internet, like how to write formulas. And it was neither of our specialty. And like by the end, you know, we sort of pressed the final like equal, (laughs) equal sum. We were like huh, no wonder every restaurant we've ever worked for has not only failed, but like just burnt down to the ground and there's no way this one's going to work. And then actually he came in and was like, could you fudge a lot of these numbers? And we're like, okay. Sure. You know, um, Sam Mason, who we've been working with for years, he gave me this piece of advice years ago when he was opening Taylor. It was delayed and everything. And I was like, how do you do it? And he like was chopping vegetables in and like, was, never cook with your own money. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Um, we're going to take a quick musical break, okay. and then we'll be back with Amanda Cohen here on Snacky Tunes from the Cayman Cookout. <laughs> Brave world, 
of 2017, you wrote a beautiful article for Esquire. Yeah. Uh, I remember when it came out, I shared it with my girlfriend now, fiance at the time. I said, Congratulations. I think, thank you. I said, I think this is the best written article on the subject because it didn't just address it head on. It was really funny that the line about my husband read it to me. I, <laughs> I, I reread it now while doing research of this and still as good as that. I know you've talked about that article a lot, but a, a year changed later. What's changed? What's seen the same? Have, do, you, do you see, and you can say no, that everything polarized, caps melting, the world is on fire, it's terrible. Do you see any monochrome of change, or how do you feel? And not to put you on the platform as the ambassador for women, yeah, but as no. someone that was very eloquent early on, and, and some of the people mentioned in your article had fallouts right. afterwards, number one being April right. and Gabriel Hamilton to whatever degree. Yeah. So it's a tough one because a, um, I mean I don't I actually don't mind being the spokesperson. I wish there was other people who were also the spokesperson, uh, and there's a couple, but I wish more people were stepping up to talk about it. Uh, and I don't I don't want to take away sort of the progress we've made, uh, but the truth is we're not nearly uh, as far ahead as I think we think we are. Doesn't mean that I think we. People, I don't think that, I do think we've made progress, but I think everybody thought we were just going to sort of like change the industry and it was going to happen. And truthfully, having written about this now for the past 10 years, and I, and I did start when I had the blog at Little Dirt Canyon and I was right. talking about all of this. And you did the Eater piece a number of years right. ago too. Um, you know, change takes a really, really long time. And the thing that's hard about change is it's really hard. Sustained change. Yes. Yeah, Not just change. like, you know, lipstick or aesthetic right. change, like skin deep, like systemic changes. Yeah. And you have to keep talking about it and you have to keep working at it and it's painful and it's boring and you feel like you're just repeating yourself over and over and over again. But the goal is, and, and we will get there one day, that there will be change. We're just not really seeing it yet in the ways that um, I think people think we have and I think a lot of people are like oh it's good you know James Beard a lot of women won awards this year it's great and it's like yeah it's totally great absolutely Jordana Rothman's food and wine list also focused a lot on a lot right. of women and that was like very notable in the shift in how it has been in the in the past totally but what happens next year and what happens the year after right. that and, and what happens do, when those people leave exactly right. and, and how do we keep this up and how do we make sure that the next generation keeps it up and it's just, it's hard. Now, I do think that, um, you know, we're still talking about it. And that's, that does mean something. And, you know, it didn't, and every interview I used to do, I wasn't always asked about it. And this now, like these days, I'm always asked about it. And people are so apologetic that I'm like, don't apologize. This is a real issue. Well, to be, like, to break the fourth wall, I, I did... Um, I was like, should I bring this up? And not not because that it's not important not to be talked about, because I'd love, we could do a million hours on this. It's more like, am I going to sit down with a male chef right. and be like, tell me about your thoughts on women? Probably not. And and, and that's on, on right. me and that's my position. But it's like, is it ad nauseum or is it something new or are you seeing are you seeing things? So it, it, it is a conflict is that, and like that because that is called out in it almost every article, right. it's like the different questions that female chefs get versus male chefs get, the mantles that they have to carry on top of being <laughs> an excellent chef and an even better financier on top of being a spokesperson for. But see, I think you should ask the male chefs that because the truth is, is that it's not, but basically what we're asking people is like, are you going to be a good human or a bad human? Yeah. Like, that's it. Like, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. Opening, like, opening question. If yeah. they say bad, interview over right. it and we'll go kick to the beach. So, you know, this isn't just about women, this is about people of color, these are all those articles that came out about um, sexual harassment in the kitchen or, you know, people who are bullied or mental health. It, it really, it sort of just keeps like building on itself. Like, how, what are you doing to make this industry better? And that's actually the question that everybody should be asked. Right. And that's a better framing, a better framing. Right. Of so what are you doing mm -hmm. to make the industry better? And it doesn't have to be, you know, people are always like, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and then they shut down and say, like, all you have to say is, you know, I'm working really hard in my kitchen and, you know, I'm making sure that these are the the new rules we have and I have an HR department and we sit down and once a year we talk about these policies with my staff. Whatever it is that you're doing that's different than last year. And I also think it's it's simple things too. It's a 50-50 like on the floor or yeah. in positions where it's like you're not just maybe you might suffer as an owner. And I think this is maybe with a chef owner versus just an executive chef. If you're a chef owner, you're like, well, I'm going to hire 50-50 and let's say that it's a person of color or a woman who might not have been given the opportunity to be as good, we're going to be a little bit slower, but we're going to bring them up right. to, to give them that opportunity right. as opposed to like, 
I'm only replacing skill for exact skill, and usually it's men because they have had more opportunities. Right. So it's like that type of cognizant, like you have to, I don't want to say suffer, but be set back a little bit, or you have to be able to work harder to in order that other people get the right. opportunity. But the reward is so much greater, yes. and that's what people don't get. And right. you know, I, I talk a lot about this woman in my kitchen who I had when we first sort of reopened Dirt Candy, and she really wanted to be a line cook. I don't really like, you don't want to do this. <laughs> she was like, I really want to do it. And we were like, Okay, and man, she was bad, but we loved her. She was, had been part of the yeah. family and yeah. had worked for us for years, and we we're like, you are so bad, and we worked, and we worked so hard, so hard with her, and finally, by the end, she was okay. <laughs> she was never going to be our best line cook, but she was not going to be our worst, by far not our worst, and it took a lot of time and a lot of our energy, but, you know, one day she turned to us and she was like, yeah, I hate being a line cook. <laughs> I don't want to even, she was like, I'm actually done with this industry. And we were like, it's fine. And, and she left and she moved on to something else. And But it seemed so horrible to us at the beginning. The truth is, by the end, we all felt pretty good. We worked really hard. We did what we were supposed to do because my job as a chef is actually supposed to be a leader. And I think it's supposed to be a part teacher. And that's what we did. And she took skills from the restaurant that she will use in other parts of her life. And that's actually how, you know, for all the shitty days we have in the restaurant, and we have so many, and running a restaurant is so hard, the fact that every once in a while you sort of, you know that you're going to leave the industry better than you found it, and that there's people who are going to come through the kitchen and take something away that, like, you would never even have expected. Yeah, I mean, it's so tough because I think that there's hospitality in general is one of the most myopic day-to-day, yeah. like, Sisyphean tasks. So it's so hard to be like, not even just like out of three months, but the years yeah. and everything. And, and also knowing that you might invest in people that it doesn't, you know, that story could also, and then she was, you know, <laughs> insert like some up and coming. You're like, oh my God, that story is amazing. You're right. like, no, it's just someone who was here and we got them to here and then they left, but it was, they got more opportunities. Yeah. I mean, one of the other systemic changes though, is I, this week they announced that um, 11 Mass and Park will no longer be allowed to be I know, I'm that. so impressed. So you, you do see, you do see that it's like, oh, it's like, well, them getting taken out of the running, no one needs to give them any other awards. They can get all of them. It does begin to open it up. And sure, it might be replaced with another white right. male <laughs> chef duo, but it, it does allow even the, the women who are low on the list to begin to move up. And, right. and then it, it, it's in, that, that is an interesting change. Yeah, I think it's actually really fascinating. It's like, okay, great. You get it. You did it. It's fine. You know. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't detract from it. No, not at all. And they're still a great restaurant. They're still going to get written about. But one of the things that I've also talked a lot about in all of this is I don't get it. We keep just talking about the same 50 restaurants or the same 100 restaurants. And, okay, that's great. But we all know them. And I've eaten in a lot of them. Not, you know, not all of them. But, you know, a number. And they're good. And I want to keep eating at a lot of them. But what I want more than anything is new food. Mm. And we don't talk about that. We just keep talking about the same restaurants. And I want to be challenged. I want to grow. When I'm cooking, I... I want the playing field to be even, not because I want a chance, but like I want to make sure that like, you know, that the people I'm competing against are the best. And we, because we've sort of like so forced down all these women or people of color as well, like we're not, the playing field isn't even. We're not competing against the best and we're not tasting new food. We're just tasting the same food over and over again. Yeah, it's a jockey position. And you're involved in the world's best awards. Uh, Yeah, well, the... Yeah. No? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, but it's not the world's best. It's the World Restaurant Awards. Oh, the World I Restaurant Awards. I wanted to get the, the name right. World Restaurant Awards, yes. yes. They're, they're, yeah. the, 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 they're new. Yeah. So what are they and what are you bringing to the criteria for judging um, or nominating? <laughs> yeah. Uh, nominating, uh, judging. I think, you know, their idea is that, uh, that it's sort of a, you know. It's a work in progress. Use. Yeah, it's a work in progress. And it's a, you know, we want to do something in the world's 50 best list. And they really want to open up the field and say, you know what, there are great restaurants all over, all over the world. Let's see what's out there. And they're trying really hard to sort of, you know, make the nominating panel or the nominating group really diverse and take, you know, let everybody who's nominating people go back and, you know, go back to their country and go back to their city and uh, see what's out there. Uh, what I get to bring to it is a, you know, my knowledge of New York restaurants and Canadian restaurants and everywhere I've traveled. Uh, but also this idea that um, what we consider a great restaurant can be so much greater than 
you know, white tablecloth fancy restaurants. I mean, the Superiority Burger, which took your spot, is one of my favorite right. restaurants, and that is like narrow. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even remember how you fit that in there <laughs> now that it's in there, but I agree with you. And, and I think that most people's foods, I mean, I think Bourdain will loom large over this, yeah. this weekend, but like what, I mean, everything he ate, the best stuff on that show was like, you know, plastic stool in a bowl yeah. probably didn't cost that much, but and like, that's the food that we crave. That's all we want. Yeah. That's and all. so why aren't we saying that's great food? Yeah. And why don't we know the name of that chef that's cooking that yeah. food? And this is such a, you know, in general, those tend to be people of color or, you know, uh, you know, uh, minorities and, uh, we don't know who's cooking it. So how, how is that place that we go to every week for ramen or pho? We don't know that name, but we know like Daniel Hum's name. Not taking away from Daniel Hum, but like why don't we know that person's yeah. name? Well, I mean, I also think that like, you know, for the projects and research that we've done here, sometimes it's really hard to get a hold of them. Yeah. So <laughs> we, I mean, on the flip side, like Darren and I have gone after them for some of our projects and we just run into a right. wall and you're up against a deadline. You're like you go to those people first, but you, you know, there's no contact information. There's no way to get a hold of them. So it's like, I would almost say like add media training or like give everyone a free Squarespace <laughs> website with like a Gmail account or whatever is local. Yeah. And that would probably increase the visibility because, and Google Translate solves most things. So <laughs> No, but I know because I've tried to put together a lot of these, you know, female chef yeah. lists and, you know, who's cooking in New York City. And I'm like, you know, I'll have like my, uh, daytime uh, reservationist like you know back check the list and she's like I don't know Amanda I tried really hard yeah. so I'm like I know but call again let's try to get this yeah. and it it isn't it's totally not easy it's also worthwhile no and I agree but I, I get how hard no, it is no, and, me. and I agree I mean and we're, we're pretty persistent and, and it does but I mean if you're just you know you're on a deadline yeah, you're doing a listicle and you're like oh, fine <laughs> these people have press armies so task at hand came in cookout what is your class that you're teaching? What what education, what knowledge are you bringing to the to the, the masses? Yeah, I guess vegetables. There's a lot of not <laughs> surprise, vegetables here. Surprise. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's actually interesting. I'm, I'm trying to figure this. I mean, I already have my demo set for tomorrow, and it's a bunch of really good vegetable dishes and different techniques that people haven't thought of. And you know, how do you make vegetables taste delicious? Um, but I, I'm a little intimidated. There's a lot of other great chefs doing demos. I'm like, Ooh, this is a lot. I hope, you know, people really want to learn about spiralizing. <laughs> there is a piece of advice I got. Um, it's it be on the other side of the room. Yeah. So if everyone is kind of doing the same thing, at the very least, yeah. you're going to be over there. <laughs> and, and people might see it as a, a com- accompaniment or might open their right. their eyes yeah. to the, the possibilities of reducing the carbon footprint and totally. just finding new ways. Totally. And I mean, we've gotten people are like really interested, but it's still like, okay, yeah, I'm not like, you know, I'm not taking you out on a jet and chopping a carrot on the jet. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not snorkeling and doing a bonfire for like a natural walking. <laughs> oh my God. I'm just going to show you how to make a really delicious carrot risotto. Amazing. Well, Amanda, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Where can people find you? How can they make reservations? How they come to eat? Okay. Okay. You know, DirtCandyNYC.com is the website. Uh, through there, you can make a reservation. You can also call the restaurant. 212-228-7732. Nobody calls the restaurant a anymore. 212 number. I know, right? Oof. It's crazy. Everybody tries to make reservations now through like Instagram and Twitter and like just call Facebook. Us. I'm like, can you just call? Because that's what I'm going to tell you to do. Uh, yeah. And we're open five nights a week, Tuesday through Saturday. But we're also open for brunch, which we have closed for a while and just reopened. Which you can get in all cart. Which you can get a la carte, yeah. Get those tacos. Yeah, get the tacos. They're really good. <laughs> We're going to take another musical break, and we'll be back with another part of Snacky Tunes here from the Cayman Cookout. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. in the light of
This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. Featuring a variety of interactive displays, MOFAD encourages eaters of all ages to be curious about food. The museum currently operates MOFAD Lab, a 5,000-square-foot experimental space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where Chow, making the Chinese-American restaurant, is currently on show until the end of March 2019. This exhibition celebrates the birth and evolution of Chinese-American restaurants, tracing their nearly 170-year history, and sparking conversations about food culture, immigration, and what it means to be American. It highlights the evolution timeline of Chinese-American restaurant menus, dating back to 1910, and also highlights a tasting section where participants get to enjoy tastings created by the country's most talented chefs who specialize in Chinese-American cuisine. Make sure you check out Chow while you still can. The exhibition closes at the end of March 2019. Check out MOFAD's tastings and extensive event calendar at mofad.org events. Are you enjoying this podcast? Heritage Radio Network has plenty more. My name is Dana Cowan, and I'm the host of Speaking Broadly here on HRN. Every week, I conduct intimate interviews with the brilliant, powerful women in the food world. We discuss their lives, their careers, and the ways in which they navigate the world at large. You can find Speaking Broadly wherever you listen to podcasts and on heritageradionetwork.org. You know, I really love that remix because it's kind of like back in 2005 or six when like an indie rock remix would get played everywhere. And I feel those are a little bit more few and far between. Uh, yeah, but that's, I mean, we're talking XX and Adele. That's fine. It's still few and far between. No, it, it, it really, it's really good. I, th- I think it's, I think that song is only going to get bigger. Uh, so in studio today, as teased before, Hello. we have Danzy from Computer Magic. Hey, Welcome Danzy. back to Snacky Tunes. Hello. If you remember, we had Danzy on with uh, Max and the Space Base crew. And uh, that has now kind of been put on the back burner. Max is in a band. And uh, Danzy left, went to Florida, yeah. started writing Computer Magic songs. and you is now. F- you were in Florida? I went to Florida for like six months. Or oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 let me, I missed you. <laughs> we stayed in touch, and she told me she started writing computer magic stuff. And then um, we played a bunch of C. I saw you back when you played a bunch of CMJ shows. And then I was just uh, listening to your SoundCloud, and it's fantastic. So. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm flattered. So, I'm glad you like it. how did computer magic come about? Um, it was kind of just me in Florida, really bored. And wanting to see if I knew how to make music. What part of Florida? Tampa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fine. And Fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I didn't really have a car or any means of transportation. So I kind of just stayed home a lot and just literally made music every day. And I didn't even realize that I knew how to make it. And it just, I do you just have, started Do you have something. background in instruments or was this just. No, when- I, well, when I was in elementary school, I played the clarinet and that's it so the answer, for like a year. Okay. So, yeah. the, answer, really so the answer is a resounding yes then. Well, a <laughs> well. little bit. I, do, I don't know how to, uh, like, when I play um, on the keyboard, I don't know the notes. what notes I'm playing. Right. It's all by ear. Right. Hmm. So. Everything that's up on your SoundCloud, you said before, was essentially just demos. But you said you just have you have an EP coming out. Yeah. So how did you? And you said there's live instrumentation mm-hmm. on it. So you just would write the electronic parts, and then what? What would happen next? Um, yeah, the new EP coming out has a live bass on it. Um, yeah, everything that I wrote, there's just live bass on it now, and live guitar on it, and live drumming. But it's all what I had written out. Uh, oh, so, parts it's, so it's like instrumentation of like what you already had sketched. Yeah, what I already had. And it's uh, um, the producer did a really good job. And uh, So you said, I'm, I'm curious about this because uh, there's just so many different ways to make music and I always love hearing about the different, like everyone, you know, it's great. I like that you're just like, I wanted to do it. I wanted to see if I could do it, so I did I it. just, yeah, yeah, I had no, I wasn't doing it with the intent Right. For people to like, I didn't even know that people would like it. Which is, I just which, tried it. Yeah. Which I always find is like the best approach whenever people, you know, like, oh, how do you do these things? It's like, well, you just kind of, you kind of start doing it, yeah, and then you figure it out, 
you don't like wait until everything is perfectly in place because you'll never get started. Yeah. No, you'll never get started. And also, just it's got to, I mean, what we're talking about earlier in the show, you just got to trust your instincts. I yeah. mean, that's what people, that's why people like artists and things like that, or people like tastemakers, because you're finding something inside of you and it's very personal. And then you'll be like, I think the world will like this. I hope that. Yeah, I hope that people like it. So, who did the live instrumentation? You sent it out, or you have friends play on it? Um,. Uh, my friend James Morley plays guitar. Um, my friend Justin Coles plays bass. And uh, my friend Chris Egan plays drums, but he's not on the live recordings uh, that we just did. He just started playing live like a month ago or something. Hmm. We, re- we recorded four songs in September that'll be on the EP. Uh, what's the name of the EP? Who's it coming out on? Um... White Iris or Black Iris? It, uh, it's Black Iris, but they just started uh, another label called White Iris. Mm-hmm. But the Black Iris guys uh, produce the Best Coast record. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, our favorite. Like, Fe- Fool, our Fool's friends. Gold and like yeah. the band, the band Fool's Gold. Uh, they were on the sh- they were on the show before. Love those oh, really? guys. Yeah, they're really really awesome. Lewis. Oh, he was the one who was on the show. He produced the. Computer magic. What a thing. small world. Oh, yeah. What a small radio yeah. shipping container. Anyway. Um, so can we talk to you quickly about your influences? So the, the About You definitely has that like 50s. I mean, that's a classic song structure of like mm-hmm. a very slow to like this like powerful orchestrated thing. It, you know, it yeah. popped up in disco and things like that. And now you're applying it to your music. Um, mm-hmm. What made you, what drew you to that structure? And then also what other influences can we expect to hear from your music? Well, with a lot of my songs, sometimes when I start to make them, I just want to see if I can make a certain kind of song. And I started reading up, um, do you know, Phil Spector. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Phil Spector. I mean, yeah. He, uh, uh, he created this thing called um, The Wall, Wall of Sound. Sound, and I wanted to just try to do that with, my, with the uh, instruments I had on my computer. So I just basically. That's really interesting. So you try to make an electronic because he yeah. based it on like the sh- just the sheer number of so instruments I, yeah. in the room, and you're trying to do it. I'm trying to recreate on well, a laptop. I have a. I use a lot of sounds from um, this plugin called the Mtron. Um, it's uh, samples from a Mellotron, so it's all uh, like flutes and violins, and I just put like a lot of reverb on it just tried to make it sound really big even though it's not really real like yeah. live instruments I mean the thing about about you is that it swells yeah at the end I mean it, which it, is great if that that's is definitely raw you know Ronettes. I mean that's definitely like that is Phil Spector right there I mean that's that when I was into it that was a good so why don't we get you uh, doing your DJ set let's get you on the ones and the twos okay what or the people, zeros can, and the ones what, what can people expect in this DJ set um well I'm gonna play a few computer magic songs and um, I guess just some of my influences. They great. kind of range a lot. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, so you were listening to... Yeah, you yeah can go, go, over, go over there. Mm-hmm. This is what we like to call the uh, talk over while we talk over. I thought it was the walk over. I don't know. We, I guess we don't really have an official name for it. So as uh, Danzy gets set up, uh, you're listening to Snacky Tunes where your host finger on the pulse. And if you want to hear Danzy and Space Space guys... Oh um you can listen to our podcast, which you can find on iTunes. The gifts, Michelle. Michelle, uh, Michelle I might lose my. She, I might. She keeps. Lose she, my she mind. has this magical bag of cheese. What are we? What, are, hold on, what is this? It's a chocolate covered orange slice. All right. Okay. Uh, all, right. all right. Fine. Hey. Hey. Why not? Listen. Yeah. Uh, there's this magical bag and cheese and meats and almonds keep coming out of it. And uh, we're about to get into the future with Danzy and Computer Magic. Danzy, you ready? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Here we go. We got a uh, live Computer Magic set coming at you on Snacky Tunes Heritage Radio Network dot com. Uh, shout out to everybody. Take it away.
I, I have dairy induced cataract right now. I can't see anything. <laughs> I just see rinds of cheese. And uh, while I sit here in my perpetual co- cheese darkness, Dan's. I gotta say it. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. It's really oh, good. Man. Thanks. Your I'm, voice. I'm, damn it. I, I, and I love how you're just like I'm gonna try, and then what's come out of you? I don't know if if, if anyone, but Danzy, you are a, a sort of a pixie esque sort of small little package, and there's a lot coming out of you, and it's fantastic. You know, and a lot of bands they do media training. They're like, you know, we just kind of got together in like the garage and like tried, and you're like, no, that's not true. That's not all happened. But you know, Tampa, Florida will breed. Uh, I, I now I can't. Can say I bad ask? Can about I, Tampa. What, what were you doing in Tampa? I just needed to take some time off from. New York? And stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And how? But I mean, why Tampa? My mom lives there. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, you yeah. weren't just you weren't just no, like no, not specifically. <laughs> it was like yeah. dart to a map no. of America. Yeah, I just stayed with my mom for like a little while. A lot of cooking. Any cooking? Yeah, it was really good actually. I was cooked for like every day. It was really <laughs> awesome. What, what's what's mom's specialty? Um, I don't know burgers. I guess like we went out to eat a lot too. Good, good cuisine in Tampa. Um, a lot of Outback Steakhouse, Chili's. A lot of chain restaurants, yeah. Gotcha. So um, macaroni grill. Are you playing? So now the EP is the EP is coming out in mid March. Yeah, March fifteenth. And uh, are you playing any shows in New York anytime soon? Um, we'll probably we'll probably have a show before uh, that week in March before before everyone hits South by before South. Are by. you doing South by? Yes. Any shows lined up for South by? Um, there is a show. It's uh, for Black Iris or the White Iris Showcase, and I'm almost certain it's on Friday. Awesome. But, Daytime. Yeah. You know what? We'll, we'll get there. If I wanted to find out MySpace, Twitter, yeah, Facebook. I d- I don't know the time or anything yet. I just know it's on Friday. No, wh- what and what are your nuts and bolts of a uh, MySpace, Twitter, Facebook? Oh. How do I find you online? Oh, just type in Computer Magic. And also on thecomputermagic.com. But it comes right up, yeah. Is Computer Magic, if I type it in, are you the first return on Google? Yeah. Huh. Uh, Dan's, for all of you that don't know, um, has a blog, zdans.com. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, and we met when she was a vi- she was a vice intern. Yeah. And had, like, the biggest hair. No joke. Like, <laughs> this, like, bird's nest of hair. And I was like, who... <laughs> Who has hair like that? And I feel like I should know them. Uh, and then we became friends. And her blog is great as well. So and that's Z D D A N Z yeah dot com. Um, so if that. you get and you still actively post on that, yeah, ish. I've kind of gotten lazy recently and just post weird YouTube videos. Well, then the best way time. to say it is that there's a treasure trove <laughs> if you've never been there of untapped songs. It, uh, it really is. Um, Dan, thanks for coming on. I'm yeah, really excited. No uh, I can't. I would love to. Uh, Figure out a way to get you guys in here and play some type of live situation. Yeah, but maybe we'll get, we'll get you in. We'll, 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 we'll let you figure it out. Yeah, we'll let, we'll let, we'll let you. We'll, we'll do like a six. We'll let you that, that incubation period that we always talk about. That's so important. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, so what's the last <laughs> no, song? No, 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 we talk about it. <laughs> okay, fine. And Michelle, Michelle, thank you, Michelle. Uh, f- hands down, and I know I said this off mic, but I will say this is by far one of our favorite food guests. Not because. You fed us because what you have done is pretty uh, inspiring, and it's awesome to have you in here. Thank you we, very we, much for having me. We brought you in for the cheese, and literally, there's there's so much more. I think the, we could have uh, done the, the passion two hours. of the cheese, right? Is that that movie's coming out? Darren, <laughs> no, no. Uh, and anyway, so thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. Next week we have uh, baths uh, in studio, and Alan, whose last name escapes me, who's writing uh, a comprehensive book on food television. Oh, fan- no, that's not, I I would listen to that. Yeah, I would, and uh, and if you have enjoyed this show or any other show, please check out our podcast. Just uh, type in Snacky on iTunes, and you can subscribe to everything for free. And is it next week our big announcement? Uh, in a couple weeks. A couple weeks. Uh, so, Dance, what's the uh, what you got coming up? What's the last song we're going to play us out with? Uh, the last song is a computer magic song called uh, Grand Junction. Fantastic. And really, I can't stress enough, go to her SoundCloud and just press play and listen through all of it. It's 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 a it's a solid like hour of... Uh, just hanging out doing work <laughs> and and uh we will be berating you enough till you send us an advanced copy of that ep all right uh so, anyway, so thank you so much never forget good to be back uh looking forward to uh doing a few more shows with you this month we'll be back next week with absolutely no tips on valentine's day i can guarantee you that uh and, oh yeah it's val <laughs> oh yes it's valentine's day next week uh well you know here's my tip don't go out to eat on valentine's day period yeah. don't go don't even go out this weekend 
Like, just, does, just, it, does it extend? Yeah. Does it extend to this Dude, weekend? It's it's New York. It's all holidays are like the weekend before. Don't go out to eat. Go get some of these cheeses. Go get some of that. No, but you can't. You gotta find. You gotta find a local party. Fine, that's fine. It's go get some of that uh, yeah. that almond butter and Oof. and make your own memories. Right? Am I right? It's oro liquido. Or Likido. Yeah, leak it up. Exactly. Thank you to Jack Inslee. <laughs> Thank you to HeritageRadioNetwork.com. Terry Diabolic. Did you never forget uh, Computer Magic? Take it away. about food, we talk about music. 
music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to learn more about our 10-year anniversary celebration happening all year long, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. And you can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without the support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.